Well, Bob, thanks for joining me. Um, so for like the last year or so, a lot of what I do is I help people who are interested in pro-liberty ideas become more effective communicators. And so a mutual friend of ours uh, in, introduced me to you and what you do, which is help people become better communicators. So why don't you tell me a little bit about what you do, but I'd like to hear the story of sort of how you got there because it's a very unusual occupation. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you so much for having me on. I really appreciate you making time to have me on your show. Yeah, my and, pleasure. Yeah. And so would you want me to start with what I'm doing now or how I got there? What would you prefer? I would say give like a, a kind of short summary of what you do now and then what led you to such an unusual place. <laughs> sure. Yeah. And so I'll say in a nutshell, what we do is we help people to build their brand. And we like to think about that as a long-term game where people become more comfortable talking about the stuff that matters most to them. And so that's what we do. And my girlfriend, Mary Rose, and I started a business maybe three years ago, and we call it the Ewing School. And we've never had to do any marketing because we were able to organically grow it by using the folks within our network. And they've, we've slowly had people come to us and ask to work with us. And so we do. Our basic business model is different than most. We don't do one-off clients or one-off workshops. We don't help. If someone says, I have a big presentation coming up, like we'd happy to help connect them with someone that could do that. But what we do is we sign year-long contracts with organizations to say, let us work with your key spokespeople and we'll help them over the course of a year to like fundamentally change the way that they communicate and right. Well, and yeah, we're, we need it. to dig into that. Cause that's, I, I think that's um, a, it's a real innovation because every communication coach that I've ever seen or, or worked with predominantly it's here's my one day or one weekend workshop. And yeah. it's good in the sense that you can take somebody from wildly incompetent to not <laughs> wildly incompetent. Yeah. But in terms of what actually goes into becoming a, a better communicator it's it's definitely a journey and so I, it's fascinating to me that you decided to do that so we'll, we'll come back to that but so sure, how did yeah, you start absolutely. out how did i start out uh, how far back do you want me to go well let's say once you enter the workforce <laughs> <laughs> okay it, it so I had a roundabout path and, and I'll, I'll do my best job to, to say this in a, in a short amount of time. But so when I went to college, there wasn't any sort of student group that organized folks based on their interests that I was aware of. There wasn't something like Students for Liberty, for example. And I had no idea about any of this stuff when I went to college. And maybe halfway through college, I ended up realizing that I was interested in philosophy and ideas and like what is true and how do you interact with people in an effective way? How should you live? What's the best way to interact with folks? I started getting interested in politics and economics. And I ended up realizing I wasn't really into politi the major political parties, but I loved this idea of being an activist or helping to, to make the world better, which is, I think, a common thing for young people, especially in college. And so I ended up going to a political rally and it was all, it was it, 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 in Toledo, Ohio. And it was the people that were not in the, it was all the third party candidates that were running for mayor. It was, a, it, was a, it was supposed to be a press conference, but no press came. And so I'm standing there, right? And I was with, there was a political party then called the Natural Law Party. And I was really interested in them. It turns out they were actually a front for transcendental meditation, which is a whole fascinating wormhole. I'd be happy to go down. But that's, this guy stood up to talk and he was, a, a, he spoke. And I, I would love to find this guy. I can't find him. I think he was Middle Eastern. He's wearing a baseball hat, t-shirt and jeans. And he ended up giving this speech that just, blew my mind. And, and I looked at the guy I was with and I go, who's that? And he says, that's the libertarian candidate. And I never heard that word before. I'm like, what's a libertarian? And he goes, basically they're anarchists. And I was like, oh my God, well, that's like terrible. Like I want to like throw bombs or something. Right? I had like no idea. Right. And so like, that was it. So I'm basically like, that's my only exposure. So then I go online, I start like typing around and I ended up finding this guy who wrote this weekly column. So I start reading it and I got really into this, this weekly column. And it's like, these are the ideas I love. And so I, I got so into it that I drove by myself like five hours to see this guy give a talk. And so he's about to go on stage and he's just hanging out there. I just walk into this hotel by myself or I have no idea what I'm doing. And I walk up, I see the guy standing there. And so I ended up talking to him for like 10 minutes. And I ask him, how did you learn so much about economics since you're not an economist? 
and I'll never forget this because he puts his hand on my shoulder and he looks me in the eyes and he says, the foundation for economic education. And so then like a couple of years later, I'm like working, I, I'm graduated from college. I'm like working at home, like selling pizza coupons door to door for straight commission. I'm not exactly like having the most glamorous thing. And then so I call up one of my brothers. I say like, dude, I gotta like kind of get, get my life together. And he says like, read the book, What Colors Your Parachute, right? So anyways, I end up going through this process and I end up getting a job at the Foundation for Economic Education, right? I remember this conversation. I didn't actually get a job, I got an internship. I applied for a job and they said like, you don't have any skills, why would we hire you? But we'll give you an internship, right? And they actually said, the, the president's wife said, if you can guess the name of our dog, we'll give you an internship. And I got it right on the first try. Guess what it was? Well, let's see. Uh... Woodrow Wilson. <laughs> Close. It was Mises. The dog's name was Ludwig von Mises. And so I, uh, so I got this internship. And my first week there, the, the guy who told me about it, who put his head on my shoulder years ago in college, he showed up to give a speech. And I got to drive into Manhattan to pick him up. So I drive to Manhattan and I pick him up. This is like pre like cell phone. And uh, he gets in the van and he says, how'd you hear about fee? And I'm like, you, like you <laughs> told me about fee, right? And then I got lost because I didn't have like a way to get back. And so like, I'm late showing up. There's 150 people here to see this guy. Uh, and then afterwards I drive him to his hotel. He writes me a nice letter on official stationery. And that just sort of got me on this path. Uh, I ended up staying at fee for a year and a half and building a network. And then from there, I went to VC and just applied for a bunch of jobs. I got an entry level job at the Institute for Justice, which was amazing. And I worked my way up to communications director there, which is a public interest law firm that puts a lot of effort into arguing not just court of law, but also court of public opinion. And then I got approached to be the media director for the Mercatus Center and did that for a while. And then the executive director said, hey, why don't you start a training team here? Uh, because I actually wasn't interested in media. I built a good media team, but I wasn't really interested in media. I was interested in interacting with folks. And so I built a training team. And so that way I could work with the outreach folks and people going and testifying before Congress and giving presentations and communicating when it had nothing to do with media. And that worked really well. So then I just decided, let's take the show on the road. And Mercatus stayed, I kept doing exactly what I was doing for Mercatus uh, as a contractor though, and then started working with other clients. Yeah, well, it's quite a journey. And um, we've had guests from several of those places. Uh, I mean, <laughs> yeah. basically, you hit a lot of the best uh, places in the free market universe. The, that's I got, a, I got a lucky. foundation. Yeah, I'm very grateful that I just happened to stumble across the guy that put his hand on my shoulder and said, Foundation for Economic Education. Do you want to mention who that was? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, he ended up running for president maybe five years later and kind of became a bit of a sensation. His name was Ron Paul. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. So um, at what stage, when you w came into this universe, did you already have like a solid foundation communication skills or is that something that kind of evolved as you were working in these various roles? Yeah, it, you know, it was something, I would say specifics evolved, and, but it's in my nature to be interested in this stuff. Right. Uh, a good example would be when I worked at Fee. And so I'm at Fee. When I showed up at Fee, I had no idea intellectually about anything in terms of economics or policy or philosophy or that stuff. I, I just started kind of exploring in, in college a little bit, just kind of ordering books off this new site called Amazon. <laughs> right. But like I had no idea what I was doing. And when I got to Fee, but I always just had a natural interest in interacting with folks. And I, I think to the extent that I was decent at something like that, that would have been my thing that I was a little bit on the right side of the bell curve of. But there was, a, I've thought about this looking back and at Fee, there were, there were two interns for like the first year, me and a guy named Jude. Jude was a little younger than me, but he was like a true academic and he was a wonderful guy. Loved Jude, like one of the best people I've ever met. And Jude's like, when he was a teenager, he was getting published like at the Mises Institute by, uh, there were groups offering him to to publish books, like, please write a book for us kind of guy, right? Like no one was offering me <laughs> right. anything like that, right? But so, uh, but so it's true academic. And, but so Fee did this thing called Evenings at Fee where once a month folks would get together. Now this is back when Fee was up in New York and once a month they'd have a big speaker, right? And so I just, on my own accord, just found in the basement, all these old books. I was like, oh my God, these books are awesome, right? I want to bring them up so people can see them that are coming in, right? They're all in the basement and all these people would love to see them. So I just built like a table and 
started bringing these books up and just started selling them to anyone who's interested. Like no one asked me to do this. I didn't even think it was work, right? But all of a sudden we got to the point that at evenings at fee, we would sell over a thousand dollars in books. And I'm just behind the counter, just kind of selling books. And I didn't think of it as sales, but I was just really interested in the books, right? And several people that I became, I started a book club and like the people in the book club became the highest level donors that, that Fee had. And, and so I realized that I wasn't particularly, I wasn't probably going to win any Nobel prizes for my economic thinking, right? But like, I, I was pretty good at interacting with folks and I've just kind of run with that, right? Um, another example would be, I always thought that I would go to law school and then, and then I thought I would go get a master's degree in economics. And then there came a moment when I was working at the Institute for Justice and I realized I had gotten promoted up to this position where my office was as big as the guy who argued the infamous Kelo case before the Supreme Court. And I'm sitting in these conversations early on developing strategies for lawsuits on the court of public opinion side. And I love it. And I'm interacting with clients and I feel like I'm a part of this. And at IJ, you know, cause you had Jeff Rose on it, You're not in the stands commenting on the game. You're in the game helping to advance the ball. And it's thrilling. And, and I realized if I left the labor market to went and could get a law degree, there's no way that I could get hired at IJ. I, I couldn't go. I, I mean, they could hire everyone from Harvard. Like they could fill right. up their slots. Like there's so many people applying to be attorneys there. Right. And I would be a mediocre attorney, probably, right? Maybe I could do okay at it. Maybe I could do good, but I, I doubt I could get in at IJ as an attorney. But as a comms guy, like here I am, man. And I'm like, and I'm participating and I love it, right? And, and so I used to joke when I was at Mercatus, Mercatus will pay you to, to get an advanced degree at George Mason University. They're a university-based research center. And I would joke that I could now finally go get an economics degree for free, but it would still cost too much. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I, I'm happy you made that point because one of the things that I, I interact with a lot of young people and the, they don't realize how much opportunity there is for people interested in free market ideas. Like the, there's kind of this sense of, well, you're either, like you said, like a lawyer at IJ or, you know, a policy wonk at Cato or something, but that there's this expansive universe where kind of any set of skills can be used to like build a really good career for yourself here. Like that's, I don't think that's widely known and yet it's, it's really important because yeah. I mean, so one thing that is striking is that your skill set actually, I think is scarcer within this universe than the skill set <laughs> is of super smart people who really understand ideas. Because one of the things I observed is just the ability to communicate in a compelling way pro-freedom ideas. Like that is, we're not suffering from an abundance of that. Uh, and and look, I say that not like, uh, you know, me on top of the hill, like the best in the world. Yeah. When I started out, I literally couldn't order a Subway sandwich without kind of stammering and stuttering over my words mm -hmm. and not like a formal stutter, but just like I couldn't like form coherent thoughts very well, except in writing. Writing, I was very good. But in terms of like speaking, and certainly I get a lot of social anxiety if I'm not, if I'm in a room with people I don't already know. Yeah. So like, I'm saying that as somebody who see, says like, we all need to get a lot better. And there's not, there haven't been a ton of resources that I think have been really useful or a lot of tactics that help people kind of climb that mountain to being more mm -hmm. effective communicators. What do you see as sort of the, some of the biggest stumbling blocks or barriers that keep people who want to be more effective at communicating their ideas back? Sure. I will. And I'll just say in terms of logistics, because we're, we're on zoom, when you're talking, I want to make eye contact with you by looking at your face. And then when I'm talking, I'll do my best to make eye contact with the actual camera, but I don't want it to, feel awkward like I'm, I'm not staring off into space or something like that uh, just throwing that out there for whatever it's worth in terms of the biggest roadblocks that people face right I, I think that people get so caught up in their own world that it's hard to move outside of it right and so I, the best book ever written on messaging in my opinion is written by the Heath brothers and it's called made to stick and mm -hmm. they say that the key barrier the biggest obstacle is what they call the curse of knowledge. And other people have used that phrase. And it's, and it's really hard, right? And so I think that there's a liberating way to, to do an end around around that, which is when people start to go into communications, they feel like they have to write out scripts and they feel like, it, it, like I, I need to put all of this effort into learning all of this stuff, right? 
And I think that, that, that it's liberating to say, you, you don't actually have to do that, right? And if you could say, okay, instead, instead, all you have to do is say to yourself, I just want to be useful. And that's it. And I think that putting that lens on is actually liberating is if I'm interacting with you, Don, it, it, I don't have to think, okay, I need to like write out a particular script that, that, that I could, that whatever I, I want to say for Don, but it's, I just want to listen to Don, ask me questions and I want to answer them as best I can. And I, I just want to be useful for Don. He, he has a podcast he, it's, and it's going very well. He's working on persuasion. And so I, I just want to think maybe in advance on what are some key ideas I want to share or what are some stories that I want to share? And we could go into details on, on those, but that I, I, if I just focus on being useful, it'll be more liberating than if I'm focusing on writing out scripts or feeling like I, I have to do this whole different universe so to speak, right? And I think that that's the foundation to start building from, is thinking about, instead of looking at the world through my eyes, I want to look at the world through my audience's eyes. And then we build from there. That is, that's very aligned with how I think about things. And it's very different from how typically a lot of communication coaches operate. I remember the first person I worked with who's like well-known in the industry, it was, all right, you need to have your talking points. And what I'm going to really teach you is how to stick to them even when people are asking you stuff that has nothing to do with them. How do you sound like you're not being evasive and get back to what you want to say? And in a certain way, that's kind of the training that's geared towards, you know, the politician who has, you know, 30 seconds to like get something out of there. Um, It's not, it's certainly not, I think, uh, that that kind of approach isn't necessarily, I hope, what he would say if it was like, how do I become a more effective communicator in every facet of my life? Yeah. But that because but that's sort of the training ground, right? We draw certain lessons about we principles of communication from this really weird, constrained sort of like you have 30 minutes or 30 seconds and don't get yourself into too much trouble. So yeah. and that becomes the framework through which communications are channeled, which is um if you've ever like seeing, you know, how a corporation responds in the wake of some controversy and you go like they're, they, they seem like this alien creature who, you know, just doesn't like want to get in trouble. Um, that is definitely not kind of the orientation that one should have if you're at trying to make a positive impact in the world, right? Like I want, I have a message that I think is really helpful and I want to get it out there. And in order to do that, I have to connect with people. And so if you're taking a framework that's really established from like avoiding negative downside, that's probably going to lead you in a really bad sort of direction. So I think starting with useful, I think is, is good. And, but I think part of what happens is that that orientation is very foreign to a lot of people who come from, even if they're not formerly academics, if their primary interest is like, I'm interested in ideas and now I want to promote my ideas. There's often not a real understanding of, who their audience even is. So that's one of the things that comes up with my clients a lot is like they get, oh, I should be thinking about the audience, what's important to them, what will be clear to them. They go, but I don't know who my audience is. Mm -hmm. So like, do do you have advice on how do you even start to build that if you don't already have like a clear knowledge of who you're trying to reach, who you're trying to help, what their problems are, what their aspirations are? Sure, yeah. Clarity is fundamental to communication, right? And so if someone says, I don't know who I'm talking to, right? That that creates problems, right? And so the more clarity we have on who we're actually talking to, the better we can talk to them, right? If I'm talking to my mom, it's different than if I'm talking to my girlfriend or talking to a politician or talking to a middle schooler, right? And so if I don't know who I'm talking to, that's, that's a problem, right? And so it's important to understand who I'm talking to, right? So I like to divide communications up into three buckets and people divide it up in different ways, but I think it's most useful for my clients to have them think of three because people can understand the the number three and it can stick in your head. And so I'll say messaging, delivery, and audience. Messaging is what you say, delivery is how you say it, and audience is who you say it to, right? And so from an audience, and so if we're gonna work on a presentation together, right? Let's say, yeah, I'm working with the president of an organization, he's got a big talk in a couple of weeks. We'll say, okay, first off, who's the audience? Who are they? What are they interested in? And how can you best help them, right? And th- that's a useful framework. If I'm going on TV, it's going to be different. If I'm talking to the NPR, it's different than if I'm talking to my board of directors, 
right? But so we could talk through a little bit more on that if I have no idea who it is, but people will often say, I don't know who my audience is. And then we'll, we'll just kind of start dialing in. Well, who, who are you going to be talking to? Or let's just imagine we could create a composite or let's just start with a friend of yours from high school or college, right? An intelligent person that may not have subject area expertise in your line of work. And then that's it, right? Uh, but so I'll have to, we'll, and we'll also say like, what good is your white paper if nobody reads it, right? And so we, we have to be able to effectively bring it out to the outside world. But so we'll do we'll, audience and then messaging is what we say. Right. And so, and then delivery is how we say it. So messaging, I like to divide it up into a few different ways. And I like to say like, what's the core, right? And, and this is going to back to made to stick, but what's the core idea? And, and the core idea is you have to strip away everything else to find the core. This is hard to do. An example I like to give is when I worked at the Institute for Justice, like law is complicated. Like most of the stuff your readers and listeners and uh, viewers are dealing with is probably going to be complicated. Economics, history, policy, politics. But like anything else, we could take it and, and find the core and then go from there. So there was a, loss, a few lawsuits that we filed at IJ that had to do with licensing caskets and getting those. It, there was laws that said you had to be a licensed funeral director to sell caskets across state lines. And the law was very complicated on this, but it was a licensing case. And so the, the key idea, the big idea, the core that we, that, that we found working on this, we got it down to just four words. And no word was more than four letters long. And it was, it's just a box. That's it's so just, good. Right? It's just a box. And every letter to the editor, every op-ed, every conversation, whether it was to another attorney, to a judge, to everyone, it's just a box. And when you understand that it's just a box, everything else falls into place. There's no reason to require a license to sell what is just a box. Right? The only reason this licensing law is on the books is to protect the financial interests of that powerful funeral lobby, right? Whatever it may be. And I could just keep going, right? Our clients are prepared to go all the way to the Supreme Court if that's what it takes to vindicate the right to earn an honest living for Americans everywhere or whatever, right? But you've got sort of these kind of core ideas. There was one of the best-selling business books of the last decade is a book called The One Thing. And the one thing, basically, they say single task, right? You're going to get a lot further if you single task and if you multitask. So they start that book off with a proverb, a Russian proverb that says, he that chases two rabbits catches neither. It's like, boom, done. You don't need to read the book, right? That proverb tells you everything you need to know. He that chases two rabbits catches neither, right? And so I'll work with clients to say, from your messaging perspective, I was just with a couple of economists before we hopped on here, and we said, okay, you, you just published this research, like what's the core, right? From a messaging, what's the core? And then what's a proverb that we can explain that in, right? And this takes a little bit of effort, go on. Well, yeah, well, I, I just wanna interrupt you because I actually think that this is the most important and hardest part for most people of communication. Like, and, and, and I'll speak for myself. Like I actually did not find, I, I found it really hard to write my uh, books, but way harder than that was then, all right, how am I going to like in, you know, two minutes on the radio convey what I'm saying and make it sound intriguing, memorable, distinctive, <laughs> and so on? In other words, yeah. the process that you're talking about, what, do you have specific kind of tools or exercises that you do with clients that help them build that skill? Because like, it's only a box is utterly brilliant, but it's how the hell do I get to it's only a box? Yeah, no, a hundred percent, right? And so, yes, y yes, we do. And this is exactly why, I don't want to do one-offs with people, right? And so what I want to do is build, what, what we do at our organization is we build mastermind groups, right? Most of the mastermind groups that we build are within organizations. Some are cross-organizational. But so what we say is over the course of a year, we are going to build up certain deliverables. And I call them a mountaintop card, a storytelling catalog, and a like a feedback guide. And within those, within those by the time you're done, you, you have the tools that you need to go out and effectively talk, right? So with clarity and confidence, you can talk about the stuff that's important to you in whatever medium you find yourself in, right? Whether it's a quick conversation, a quick 30 second thing, or whether it's a 30 minute thing or a, an hour long podcast, right? You, you have, it's internalized, right? And then you can go out and do it. And I'll give you a quick example of 
of why this strategy works. When I worked at the Mercatus Center, I went to a VIP dinner at the Willard, which is this hotel that everyone in DC knows, right? It's, it's um, lots of politicians hang out there, right? And folks often lobby folks in the lobby there when they're coming and going. Many presidents have lived in the Willard. But so I was, I was at a meeting in the Willard, a VIP dinner, I'm on the second floor. There's two poli 12 of us sitting around a table. There's two politicians. There's some heads of committees. It's like a big dinner. And I'm there to help make sure that the conversational ball is flowing. And thankfully, I didn't need to. Politicians love, you know, to, to, to a lot of people in DC love to talk. And, and so the conversation's going, and the guy to my right's not saying a single word. And I wonder if he feels nervous or uncomfortable. Halfway through the dinner, he hasn't said a single word, right? And then maybe two thirds of the way through, the conversational ball lands in his lap. And he absolutely knocks it out of the park, just a home run, right? And people, oh my. So they throw another ball at him, knocks it out of the park. The rest of the dinner was like, everyone just feeding off of him, right? It, it, and there, there's a lot that we can unpack with this, but afterwards I, I said to him, I said, how did you do that, right? When the, when the dinner ended, no one's gathering around the, the senators, as you may expect, they're gathered around this guy over here, right? It's like, how did you do that? And he said, well, I've been doing research for about 20 years. And I realized I'm covering so many different topics that I, as I would talk through them, I would, I would figure out better and better ways to describe them. And I would gather, I would capture my analogies and my stories and my key ideas into a, into a, into a binder, right? And I'll just keep them in this binder. And then as, and then I would, whenever I'd come back to talk to my and refine them, I would refine them and then print them out, put them in the binder. And I, I've got this binder now 20 years old, it's, it's stacked, but I also have it in the cloud. So whenever I'm going to an event like this, if I'm, when I'm in the Uber on the way over, I just pull up my storytelling catalog and I flip through it and I think, which one of these things is my audience most interested in? And, and then I just review my storytelling catalog. Right. If you have a storytelling catalog that you've taken time to build, then it's it's like you're you're showing up like with superpowers. When, like if, you know, it's like everybody else doesn't have the armor, and you've got the armor and the magic sword. Right. It's not even like fair. And so we work with our clients to build out that storytelling catalog along with some other tools that help them to to make progress along the way. Yeah, I mean it's. I think there's a certain kind of way that people view communication that it's sort of this innate skill. And like, I think you asking the question of this guy and getting like, oh, he actually puts an effort for it. Um, like most people wouldn't even think to ask that question, just be, oh, well, he's like a naturally good storyteller. But then if you think of like, who are the best public speakers on earth, like it's stand up comedians. And that's literally exactly what they do, right? Is yeah. they build up a repertoire of material that gets tested and refined over time. And then so it's, yes, if you're actually going to be good at communication, there's a certain kind of methodology or work or preparation that goes into it. And the and I think this is in part why there's no shortcuts. Like people usually think about, I think speaking in terms of the how, which is kind of the third category. Maybe you want to say some things about that. And the how is certainly important. Like I remember the first time I realized, okay, it was okay to, in fact, more than okay to pause on stage. <laughs> let the silence sit for a second. Yeah. And I was like, oh my, like instantly overnight I'd become you know, twice, three times as good as a speaker. And there are definitely kind of the, the how tactics that are really valuable. But I think to the extent people think about messaging, it's usually more along the lines of precision and like, like lawyers and intellectuals, they're, what they're terrified of is stating something that is slightly wrong and could get criticized, right? Whereas you're, you're changing the complete focus to how do you get to the core of your message and make it memorable and impactful. And those are kind of two very, very different mindsets. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, there's different directions we can go in there, but one thing I'll talk about is, is like the mindset when you say, okay, there's a lot of people that think, oh, well, either good at telling stories and you're good at communicating or you're good at academics. Right. And, and I play into that a little bit myself when I talk about, Oh, well, I couldn't have been good at economics. And so, you know, I just started talking it, and maybe the, there's a little bit of truth to the fact that we all have certain baselines and we all have certain interests. Right. And, and that the, the more we can build the things that we naturally love, right. And the more we could 
build on our curiosity, the, the better we'll get. Uh, Walter, Walter Isaacson, who's one of the best biographers of this or any era, has a new book out on Jennifer Doudna, and who was, he compares to Leonardo da Vinci and Benjamin Franklin as one of the most amazing human beings ever to live. And, and she's alive and she's here now, right? But she's the one who created CRISPR technology, right? Which is going to fundamentally transform the world. And he talks about what's the key. And he's the one who wrote the biography on da Vinci, the biography on Einstein, the biography. Steve Jobs, you know, people thought very arrogantly asked Walter Isaacson to do his biography, not knowing that he was about to die. Uh, but so he's done Jennifer Doudna. And he says, the thing that connects all of these people is a curiosity and a willingness to grow, right? And like, that's it. Right. It, it's not it doesn't matter where you start from. All that matters is a willingness, a willingness to keep going and a curiosity to just to kind of try things out. And like, that's it to like ask questions. And and when you think about the best communicators, and I love that you said public speakers, because that's totally or uh, you said uh, comedians, because that's totally true. Also, like entrepreneurs, people that are really passionate about stuff. Right. Like those guys are really good. I, I, I hate I lived in DC for 20 years and or 15 years. And the people that thought, oh, we got to look at the politicians, like, no, man, don't look at the politicians. Look at people that are really honest and passionate and excited, right? Like those are the guys and gals that you want to look at. And, and and what you see is that they don't naturally start out as amazing communicators, but the amount of room you have to grow in skill development is massive, right? If people aren't familiar with Warren Buffett, they should familiarize themselves with him. He's one of the most successful uh, people of the last hundred years. He created billions of dollars in wealth and he's gotten a thousand honorary degrees, but he said he doesn't have any of them hanging up in his office, right? When he was a little kid, he was super awkward, like way more awkward than the average person. And when he went to college, super awkward, very smart, right? Super into finance and economics, couldn't communicate at all, would stare at his shoes, right? And so he ended up taking a Dale Carnegie speaking course. And he says it fundamentally changed his life, right? And he realized that, that anyone could do this. This is a skill like playing a guitar or swinging a tennis racket that anybody can learn with. And it doesn't take 30 years. It takes a little bit of time and effort. And then he said, I immediately have to go out and start applying it. So he just got a job at like a community college, just teaching, right? And he says it fundamentally transformed his life. And today he's still alive. He doesn't have any of the fancy certificates and degrees up on his wall. The only thing he has up on his wall is his Dale Carnegie certificate from like 70 years ago, because he said like it, it was foundational to his ability to, to create value for the world. Yeah. And as a communicator, the thing that's so striking about him is the ability to present things in a very um, accessible, like cut to the core of what the issue is. I mean, um, what's the, a bunch of examples <laughs> are running through my mind, but I, here's one random one that doesn't get quoted all the time, but he explained why he invested in Coke and it was, he, he contrasted it to like, you know, you, I, I'm making this up, but like, <laughs> you know, you drink a milkshake and like you're sick of milkshakes, you know, for a while. Like I, I couldn't look at another milkshake. He goes, but you know, with a Coke, you drink it and you can always have another Coke, but it was like this kind of simple intuitive thing that he's using as the foundation to explain why he's investing billions of dollars. But there's that kind of like getting to the core of an issue mm -hmm. and explaining it in a real way that is striking. But the other thing that you, that you said there that I want to uh, come back to is if you think about the contrast of like a Warren Buffett or one of these CEOs or a comedian and a politician, and obviously there's exceptions. Um, is with politicians, part of what people perceive is, I feel like I'm not talking to a, a person who's being fully themselves mm -hmm. versus the authenticity that you see in like a Warren Buffett, where you feel like it doesn't matter who he's talking to. It could be, you know, the queen or a garbage man, you're going to get the same guy. And yeah. how do you think about the issue of authenticity? Because I think authenticity, and we can talk about exactly how to define it, but I think people have an intuitive sense. It's really hard to achieve, or at least it can be really hard to achieve if you're on a stage or you're in some kind of place where you're expected to perform. Sure. And I think it's a whenever you find somebody who comes across in that kind of atmosphere, the same way they do in a living room, you've met somebody who's really achieved something as a communicator. Yeah. 
Yeah, hundred percent, right? It, it, and it makes sense, right? I love to rock climb, and so I'll, I'll quickly use a climbing analogy. I use them often, but I probably should use analogies that my audience would understand. But I think everyone will uh, understand. J- I just have to interrupt you for a second. I love that you're doing this because I I am obsessed with climbing, but only <laughs> as documentaries or videos or things. Like I, I I'm scared of heights and I'm bad with knots. So like I've, but. Please, uh, more climbing analogies. Sure, I've got a whole bunch of them. I'm going to use one right now, and in, in that analogy is it's this. Um, so when we are on a wall, it can be scary, right? And there's millions of years of evolutionary pressure saying, "Don't be hanging off the edge of a cliff." Right. And so that's something we have to overcome. And someone will say, oh, well, you know, I, I just I'm scared of heights. Well, we're all built to not jump off of cliffs. Right. We're, we're all built to find to get that gut. Oh, my God. Like what's going on and back up. Right. And so it takes everyone who climbs has this. Even Alex Honnold, who climbed, who very famously climbed uh, El Capitan without any ropes, which is absolutely unbelievable. Uh, I used to have a, as my default signature for email maybe 12 years ago, uh, Honnold, kind of before he was a household name, but when he was famous in the climbing community, he has this great quote about how like you just push yourself a little bit, a little bit, right? All of growth is at the margins, right? And, and we know this, like when you go to lift weights, right? It's like you, you, you lift a little bit and you get, you stress a little bit, your muscles get stronger. If you don't, if you don't work out at all, your muscles atrophy, right? And this is how every, we just push a little bit in. If you work out too hard, you hurt yourself and then you go backwards, right? But so this is the same with every skills. We push a little bit, push a little bit, right? All growth is in the margins. It's a little bit of stress. Same thing with speaking is I want to give my, I want to push myself a little bit, a little bit, a little bit. And then over time we make a ton of progress, right? Like all of the best things in life come from compound interest, right? What, and, and this is why for our business, we want to play long-term games with long-term people because skill development compounds over time. And we want to be with people long enough that, that they can they can clearly get to that era of compound, compound returns, right? And, and this idea of authenticity is true, right? Because just as in climbing, when there's millions of years of evolutionary pressure saying don't like hang out on cliff edges. There's millions of evolutionary, millions of years of pressure saying, don't stand somewhere without a weapon where there's lots of eyeballs staring at you. Like that's bad. That's like your, your prospects for long-term survival are not good if you are surrounded by things that are staring at you and you're defenseless. Right. And, And so we have to, just like climbing, by putting in effort, we, we overcome that fear and in, in enter this like beautiful Zen space. With with speaking, it's the same thing. Is with a little bit of deliberate practice, we work through that fear and we get to the spot that we're comfortable, right? And it, it's never that it feels totally uh, right. Even even the best speakers that have been speaking for twenty years will still get a little bit of excitement, right? But what we want to do at, at a chemical level is say, I don't want to get a huge hit of negative chemicals. I don't want to get a huge hit of cortisol when I go out on stage and I'm freaking out, like that's the default for everyone. This is how our species was designed. But with a little bit of practice, what happens is you you train yourself and anyone could do this, even Warren Buffett, right? You train yourself to, to get like a nice shot of adrenaline, to get a nice shot of like dopamine, to get a nice shot of like norepinephrine and you get out on stage and then the audience is rooting for you in almost every case. And then, so you say something and it kind of works and then they laugh or they're, or you see them make, make like they're, they're in, and then you're getting more happy chemicals in your brain. Right. And you get to the spot that, that you love doing this. Right. And, and everyone can get there. Absolutely. Just like everyone can learn through a little bit of practice, how to type or how to drive a car or how to swing a tennis racket or how to play guitar right? You can learn how to communicate in a way that you have clarity in what you say in comfort whenever you say it. I'm, I mean, I'm really glad you used the climbing analogy because I realize I'm making the same exact sort of statement or excuse, if you want to put it that way, that people are bringing to the table when I'm trying to help them with communication too, right? So like one of the things I'll do is say, yeah, if I look comfortable on stage, the first time I was ever doing tv and it wasn't even real tv it was like internet tv i remember that as the host is kind of introducing things and i'm sitting there like literally my heart like i could feel it hitting bone like that's how hard it was pumping and i had that sincere feeling like 
I'm going to pass out. It's very, once I started talking that then it became a lot easier, but it's that moment where you're going to talk and you don't know what you're going to be asked. And like, it's, you know, there's, there's no going back now. Like that was a really awful feeling. And people like hearing that because then it's, Oh, that's where I am. And you got over it. Maybe I can too. Mm -hmm. So I think that point that, you know, everybody starts out with some kind of baseline fear, but that's not, that's not reason to give up. That's just the, the inherent part of the process of mm -hmm. becoming, getting to where you want to be. Oh, dude, hundred percent. Yeah. And, and this is why, you know, I want to create a mastermind group and work with people over time is, is you say like your first time showing up to practice somewhere new is terrifying, right? The first time you walk into the Cobra Kai dojo, right? It's really scary, right? Your hundredth time walking in, it's no big deal. Your first time showing up to play your violin to, in front of these people, it's scary. Your hundredth time, it's no big deal, right? This is one of the beautiful things about our species is that we can grow and get better and improve and progress, right? And, and it's not difficult to do. It just takes a little bit of effort and a little bit of feedback, right? Feedback is this essential component. Every skill has a three-step process that repeats. It's get info, apply info, and get feedback. And that's it, right? I want to learn. I want to practice and I want to get feedback and like, that's it. Right. If I want to oh, go on. But I'm just going to ask you to say more about feedback because one of the, I think there's kind of, let's call it inherent feedback that you get just from like your own assessment of how did I do, but there's a real challenge. I think in speaking, there's a worry, right. That you're going to be judged by the audience. But as you say, the audience really wants you to succeed. And indeed mm -hmm. you can definitely see that if you try to get feedback afterwards. Right. Cause if you ask people, Hey, how'd I do? 99 times out of 100, it's going to be great. So is there something you can do more actively to get useful feedback? Because great feels nice in a moment, but it, that's not helping you take that, you know, 1% improvement that's going to compound over time. Sure. I'll answer that in a couple of ways. One, yeah, feedback is essential to growth, 100%, right? And like, and I'll use a, a, a tennis analogy where I say, like, if you just showed up and played tennis with your buddies, like, you're, you'll have fun, but you're not really going get, to get better, right? If you went to a tennis workshop and you just listened to people talk about tennis all day, you're not going to get any better, right? And so, same thing, like, people often ask me, what are, what are the best books? I love books. I can give you a ton of book recommendations. But you don't get better at a skill by reading about it, right? You're not going to get better at tennis by, by reading about tennis or by listening to people talk about tennis. You're going to get better by getting on the court and playing. Right. But if you're just playing with your buddies all week and you're a little bit of practice, but what you really want is someone there to help you. Oh, you know what? Bring your elbow in a little bit. Try that. Okay. Now try this. Okay. Now stand over here. Now try. Right. And it's this strategic, strategic practice, right? Deliberate practice is, is how we make leveraged progress. Right. Now, progress is a funny or feedback is a funny thing because we are all we all have large and fragile egos, right? And so this is this is the hack, if you will, that, that I've come up with that's super effective. And that is positive peer pressure and self-assessments to start, right? And I'll unpack that a bit. Self-assessments to start, right? I usually work with people that have a whole bunch of fancy degrees and they're high up in their organizations, like presidents of organizations, people that are arguing before the Supreme Court or they're testifying before Congress. And like, who's this guy, right? Who am I to tell them what to say, what to do, right? First off, I'll never tell anyone what to say, but I'll help them to draw out, right? I really believe this idea that education is about drawing out, not pounding in. And that, and so I'll have someone do a presentation, right? We'll record it, tape don't lie. And then before I say anything, I ask them, how did you do? What did you do well and how could you improve, right? And it's never, I, I always push back and people say, here's the negative stuff or here's the critical stuff. No, no, no. It's just, what did you do well and how can you take it to the next level? And that's it. Everyone has to do self-assessment first. Is there anything else that you see? And I'll ask them that, anything else, right? And then I have a one page that I'll give folks that I made up and I'll divide it into messaging, delivery, and audience. Messaging, how about this? Is there anything we can do in terms of structure, in terms of your opening, your ending, your key ideas, your proverbs, your stories, your analogies? Delivery, is there anything you can do in terms of verbal, nonverbal, volume, eye contact, tone, pacing, delivery, hand gestures, posture, any of this stuff, right? Audience, is there anything you can do to better connect with these particular people, right? And then again, draw more stuff out, draw more stuff out. Then and only then, will I add other stuff, right? By then they have skin in the game and they're thinking about it. And then now they want more feedback. The best way to get better at chess, by the way, is to, um, and this is like gold standard, everyone knows this, it's to review annotated master games. Once you have your tactics up to a certain level, tactics first, and then an annotated master games where you'll say, okay, here's what, uh, here, here, here's what the move Kasparov made. Now I'm gonna write down everything that I can see 
And then, and only then I'm going to look at what Kasparov sees. And then I'm going to write down what I missed. Right. And then in this process, we get better. Now I'm not saying I'm the Kasparov of speaking by any means. And this is why I want to build a, a, a mastermind group, right? Because I'm going to see stuff that the speaker doesn't see, but then you're going to see stuff that I don't see. Right. And then if we had Larry Salzman in here, he's going to see stuff that none of us see. And we get together a group, a, five, a group of say five people. And we say over the course of a year, we're going to work together. We can achieve a lot, right? And so with all my clients, we do mastermind groups and I encourage them to build speaking clubs at their place, right? Like if you want to get better at tennis, then start playing tennis together, right? And positive peer pressure is a huge force because like we are a, an evolved tribal species that is constantly interacting with each other socially and negative peer pressure. We all know like if I, everyone's smoking cigarettes around us, it's really bad. Positive peer pressure has just as much impact and it's positive. And now it's, oh, I got to show up to the mastermind next month. I decided based on the feedback I got from everyone, what I was going to work on, right? Based on what everyone said, you know, okay, I'm going to work on my eye contact. Okay, awesome. You can work with me individually as much as you want on that. But when you show up next month, you've committed to us that you're going to work on that eye contact or whatever it may be, right? And then, so then we, through positive peer pressure, through uh, feedback that we always start with self-assessments and then we always start with positives. What did you do well? And then what can you do better, right? Um, last point I'll make on this is there was a book that was a national bestseller uh, by a woman named Kim Scott called Radical Candor. And you don't need to read the book. She just says, there's, imagine, imagine a grid, right? With, with an X axis and a Y axis and I'll explain this, I think, in even simpler terms. One of them is honesty and one of them is compassion. What we want to do when we're communicating to ourselves and others is communicate with honesty and compassion. So when we're giving feedback, I want to be honest, and I also want to be compassionate. If you're honest without compassion, she calls that obnoxious aggression, and people turn away. If you're speaking with compassion but honesty, she calls that ruinous empathy, and that also harms them. But if you're speaking with honesty and compassion, then the ball moves forward in a very real way. And what I find is it's easier for people to be compassionate to others than to themselves, right? And so a big part of what we do is help people to honestly see themselves and to honestly communicate with themselves in a way that helps them to grow. Well, I mean, it, it makes sense of why, I mean, one reason why a mastermind kind of way of approaching it rather than just I'm going to ask random audience members is precisely because you can get everybody on the same page about um, compassion and honesty. And that's one of the, it's a, a lot of what makes that possible is everybody buying into that, that yes, we're, we're all going to strive for honesty and, and compassion um, because it's one of those situations where if it, it's a people feel like they're be taking a risk often when they're giving honest, critical feedback, right? Like yeah. that, that seems like very risky. Like, is he going to react negatively? Is she going to react negatively? But if we've all agreed going in, that's our job. Like we owe it to each other to be compassionate and yet to be fully honest about what could be improved. Um, then it's much more likely that people will be both honest and compassionate than if you just allow kind of a default to take place. Yeah, a hundred percent. And here's the thing is, is the feedback is speaking, right? And so there's skill in giving people feedback. And so what, what I'll find, which happens with 100% of everyone is we're in a mastermind, there's six of us in here and I'm gonna be super nice to everyone and not give them anything, any ways to grow. And then for myself, I'm gonna be super hard on myself. All right, over time, everyone gets better at this. And then as soon as they start to add constructive feedback, uh, they'll throw lots of what Teddy Roosevelt called weasel phrases and weasel words, weasel phrase. Uh, you know, maybe, I don't know if you want, maybe you could consider, uh, I don't know this stuff. Right. And then, and then over time we get rid of those. Right. And, and what we want to do is I'll always do informal, just, Hey, tell me what's on your mind or Hey, everyone's going to come bring one book recommendation. Tell us about it. And people have no problem doing that. It's once we say, okay, now here's your formal presentation. Then you go into the shell. Right. And then, okay, give me feedback. Oh, you could do it. Right. But so, the informal presentation, the formal presentation, and the feedback, they're all just, they're all, they're all you talking, right? And so what we want to do is bring in the authenticity from the informal remarks and the, the, the quality and the intention and the clarity of the formal remarks and blend them together, right? And so by the end, you could have people that are giving feedback in a way that's clear and comfortable and direct and honest and compassionate, right? And by the way, you don't have to like anyone can do this, right? This isn't some new thing that I'm doing, right? It's like, I encourage everyone, right? Like, I, like I, I'm, I have a full load, right? I, like I'm, I can't take anyone else in, but that, that everyone could go start like a, their own speaking club. Everyone could start their own mastermind group and, and start working in, in doing this kind of stuff, right? 
Yeah, I'm curious as to what have you found to be the most challenging things to help people with? I, I'm sure at an individual level, everybody has a particular thing, but are there any areas in communication that you find are kind of universally some of the hardest mountains to conquer? Sure, yeah. And in messaging, I would say to adhere to what Carmen Gallo calls the two-thirds rule. And that's something that just takes a lot of effort. And, you know, going back to the Bible of communications rhetoric, Aristotle wrote two and a half thousand years ago, he says, right, and you know this, of course, but logos, ethos, and pathos, right? The, you need all three of these in order to effectively connect with people. And academics who I predominantly work with don't default to that, right? They think, I just need to get the logos out and then the audience will understand it. And that's just not how our minds work. It, I, I like to use the analogy of a tripod, right? Logos is one leg of a tripod. And what good would a tripod be with one leg, right? The, 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 the logos is a logic, facts, figure, statistics, right? The, the pathos is about putting your audience in the correct frame of mind so they're willing to listen to you, right? People often say that it's emotion, right? It's, it's a, little bit, a little bit more than that, but right? And then ethos is what you were mentioning earlier. It's authenticity. It's your status within the tribe. I'm willing to listen to you because you have written the book on this topic in your case, right? Uh, or whatever it may be, right? But, but so you have ethos, your status, your credibility, your authenticity, uh, pathos, putting your audience in the correct frame of mind, and then logos, the facts, figure statistics. The analogy that I like to use on this is if anyone has ever, ever almost everyone has a dog or an animal at some point that they've had to give medicine to, right? And, and so I say, okay, so would it be easier for you if, if the pill was small or if the pill was, was like as big as a watermelon or something, right? Like, of course, you want a tiny pill, right? Yeah. And then if you just take the pill and give it to the dog, are they going to eat it? Like, no, they're not going to eat it, right? What do you have to do? Like, this is common sense. We know you have to put it in something that the dog finds appealing. Stick it in a hot dog, stick it in a cheese, right? We understand that. Or if you go out fishing, do you, tr oh, well, second analogy, okay, you have to wrap the pill in some tasties. You have to put, right? Like, it's this, this is what Aristotle was saying, is the pill has to be tight as small as possible. The pill is the logos. That's the logic, facts, figure, statistics. Let's work together to fine tune your logos. Maybe you can't get it down to it's just a box, but we have to make it as small and clear and compelling as possible. The pathos is the tasties, right? Now we evolved to tell stories. Like we could spend a whole other hour on how humans evolved to tell stories. Stories are prepackaged pathos machines. So, so you need some sort of structure, a, a visual, a graph, right? If you guys haven't listened to Tim Harford, he's the best storyteller on the planet. He's also a highly skilled economist. He has a new podcast called Cautionary Tales, which is incredible. Uh, the Florence Nightingale one that just came out on the power of a graph. The graph is pathos, right? It takes the complex ideas and puts them in a way that the audience will understand and listen to them, right? And, and so we need all three of those in our community, the, the logos, the pathos, and the ethos. And oh, the two thirds rule is at least two thirds of your time should be ethos and pathos. Go on. Um, well, I want to end on actually bringing out something that you said in passing, but it's something that I've been thinking a lot more about, which is the issue of credibility. So this would go under under ethos, right? Um, which is obviously, if you have a degree in whatever you're speaking on, you know, or even if you're, you know, a Fortune 500 CEO asking, being asked about your industry or something. All right, the credibility is there, but a lot of people. Who are in who are trying to persuade others of ideas, maybe formally, maybe just informally. Um, if you have ideas that are outside the mainstream, right? Like if you're challenging big parts of the welfare regulatory state, there's a certain there's a kind of inbuilt lack of credibility that you have going into it. And so, how do you think about building credibility when it's not the kind of credibility that comes in a paper, but it's you're trying to build a relationship where a person is, you want to have the person at least give you a hearing. What are kind of credibility building tools other than the formal, more obvious ones? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, a, a couple different answers to this. One is this is a really exciting space and it, it, it's going to change and it's going to be super exciting, right? I would encourage everyone, if you haven't, you, your listeners, I presume in general are kind of interested in advancing ideas that, that make the world better and the free world broadly, you have free speech, free minds, free markets. And one of the total out of the box, fascinating guys in this space is a guy named Balaji Sharananan. Uh, Balaji's interview that he just did, I, I got Shrivasana. Anyways, ba Balaji's interview on Tim Ferriss. Have yeah. you listened to this? 
Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I I was trying to put it off because it was like a three hour interview, and I'm pretty busy. <laughs> and then I heard a little clip of just him talking about s- some of the dynamics of like, um, protecting your social like attacks on yeah. your social network a- as a framework for thinking about cancel culture. I was like, all right, I have to listen to the whole thing, and it's uh, he's mind bogglingly smart. He's he, yeah, it's it's mind blowing, right? But you know, kind of big picture, we're we're gonna solve the credibility I- issue by going uh, like pseudonymous, right? And so I I can't be judgmental. All that will matter is the ideas in the excellence with which you can share them with other people, right? Like, and so once, once my voice is covered, my face is covered, right? And and your Zoom filters aren't just the fancy background, but it's, but we're truly pseudonymous, right? Then it's excellence that wins, right? And so that's the long-term thing that's going to happen. And this brings us to the most important thing. And I will adopt and have adopted the methodology of Leonard Reed, who was the founder of the Foundation for Economic Education. And in many ways, one of the guys that really advanced the modern free market movement, right? Back post-World War II, like everything, he helped to consolidate everything, right? I mean, Milton Friedman's talking out of there, George Stigler, right? Guys that would go on to win the Nobel Prize, Hayek, uh, Ayn Rand, all of these folks, right? What we're doing stuff at fee in some capacity, right? Henry Hazlitt, economics in one lesson, right? And, and so Reed said that you want to flip the way that people normally approach this. And, and this is it. And this is liberating. And this is this idea of be useful. Is he said that most people are really concerned with trying to go out and, and he would put it as set their dumb neighbors straight. But he says, the only person that you've been governed to control and manage is yourself. Right. And so rather than trying to correct your neighbor, this is also like basic philosophy of every every religion. Instead of trying to set your dumb neighbor straight, grow yourself. Right. And he used he would say certain words are analogous light and enlightenment, ignorance and darkness. And he says it's light that brings forth the eye. And so if you want to see how um, how good you are at something. Right. Just see how many people are seeking out your tutorship. Right. And so he says, right, it, it is it is light that brings forth the eye, right? And so if we want to bring forth the attention of others, just see how much enlightenment you can acquire and share, right? And, and like, so for example, let's say that someone wanted to learn about, about swimming, right? I could go learn, I could take 20 years learning all of the sales tactics and I love sales. I come from a sales background, I love it. But if I took 20 years learning every sales tactic, like who could sell more swim goggles, me or Michael Phelps? Who could sell more basketballs, me or LeBron James, right? And so the idea is, is you you focus on becoming excellent and it's through the power of attraction rather than coercion or manipulation or anything else that ideas are spread, right? And so it's like, go, go back to Balaji, right? Like he wasn't out there trying to learn a bunch of sales stuff. And in fact, you could give him a lot of advice on, on right, not ending your sentence, right? But there's a lot of stuff that he could improve, but it doesn't matter. He's so, he's become so excellent with his ideas that everyone's being drawn to him, right? And so it's, this is the, the model is, is continuous growth. And over the long term, we get better and better and better. And, and excellence is what's attractive. And it's through the power of attraction that we help to kind of light the path forward for other people. And they're drawn to us. And this is a very like respectful, liberty-oriented way to help to advance good ideas and help p- people to grow and establish credibility, right? Is through excellence. Well, this has been a real pleasure. How can people find out about what you do? Sure. So my website is theewingschool.com. That's E-W-I-N-G. So theewingschool.com. I just started a weekly newsletter for uh, my clients. I, I'm not really taking anyone else now, but I have a newsletter that I'm using based on all of the stuff I'm learning from the folks that I'm working with. And I want the newsletter to be as useful as possible. It comes out once a week. And if anyone's interested, you could sign up there. And um, yeah, I'd be happy to answer any questions, uh, feel free to email me or anything like that. Yeah. And, uh, you dive into a lot of really interesting issues. I I'm, I'm highly confident that if any of you people are on my newsletter and enjoy that, that you would enjoy this one as well. So hope everybody signs up. It's been a real pleasure. Thanks again. Yeah. Thank you so much, son. I really appreciate it.